Doc Talk with Dr. Paul Conley is copyright 2021, Signer Foundation, and is solely responsible for the content. And now, Doc Talk, brought to you by Plateau Medical Center. Here's Dr. Paul Connolly. Hello, I'm Dr. Paul Connolly, and thanks for tuning in to another episode of Doc Talk. So tonight we're meeting again with Dr. Andrew Peterson and Jamie Settle, and we're back in his clinic once again. Dr. Peterson is our local ENT, ear, nose, and throat. And tonight we're going to be talking about that first letter, ears. And so we're going to kind of go over some of the things that may affect one's ears. So we are going to talk a little bit about ear infections, and we're going to talk about the difference between an internal ear infection and an outside or external ear infection. But we're also going to talk about ear pain, and we're also going to talk about something that we all deal with as we get older, and that's like earwax and how we can keep one's ears clean. And so, folks, thanks for coming again tonight. So, again, Dr. Pearson, appreciate uh, you inviting us, you know, here to your clinic here uh, in Fayetteville. And, uh, Jamie, again, a pleasure having you on the show. So, you know, I've had a lot of patients, you know, talk about different things they want to see on Doc Talk, And, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about things with the nose. We've talked a little bit about hearing loss. But... But just ear infections and just how to keep one's ears healthy, I think, is, is something that a lot of people, you know, have questions about. And so, you know, ear infections, I think we'll maybe start with that. Um, you know, one of the statistics you had, you had sent over, you know, before the show was you're talking about that, you know, 80% of children, you know, will have at least, you know, one ear infection at age 10. And, you know, you're talking about how, you know, it's something that, you know, that we're definitely going to see uh, with our kids, but also, um, you know, you can see even as an adult. So so maybe, um, Dr. Pearson, you can talk a little bit about um, some of the, maybe the confusion about ear infections. There's inner ear infection that we talk about, and there is that outer ear, external ear infection. So maybe you can just talk about that and tell us the difference between those two. Sure, absolutely. Um, again, thanks for coming. Glad to be on the show. Um, you know, ear infections, ear pain, you know, these are a lot of things that kind of overlap as far as symptoms that we see here in our clinic and helping to break those apart as far as what are real infections versus other causes of ear complaint, ear pain is one of the things that we do on a daily basis. Um, so clinically, sometimes it's difficult, sometimes it's more straightforward. Um, ear infections, that is a great place to kind of start this conversation. Um, ear infections, we all know about them. They're very common. Certainly, they have a predominance towards children. Um, there's a few reasons for that that we'll, we'll talk about here shortly. Um, but they also do occur in adults. One of the ways I like to break down ear infections is to talk about the two main types, and that's otitis media, or a middle ear infection, and then otitis externa, or an outer ear infection. Um, the other name for otitis externa is swimmer's ear, and a lot of people have heard that. Um, think about these two structures or these two sets of infection as far as what tissues are involved. So otitis externa, that is the skin of the ear canal down to the eardrum. So that is mostly a skin infection, similar to if you had a skin infection elsewhere. So um, when you get otitis externa, aka swimmer's ear, you have a small infection of the skin of the ear canal. That can uh, occur if you've had uh, water in your ear, trauma to the ear, you're cleaning your ear too much, something else we'll talk about, um, or, or, or something else of that nature. Those infections generally are treated with topical methods, topical ear drops, etc. Otitis media, I would say that's more common, and that's the more common uh, item that we see with young children. That is an infection that is behind the eardrum. So there's no skin involved there. That's the middle ear that's lined with the same epithelium that lines the nose. Um, that basically revolves around eustachian tube dysfunction and the middle ear not ventilating properly and that middle ear getting infected. And uh, we treat those typically with oral antibiotics. So, you know, um, Jamie, maybe I tell you what, I was just noticing here, um, you guys actually have a really good diagram there. So maybe, Jamie, if you want, can you show us a little bit about um that ear canal and then i see the eustachian tube and everything there maybe you can um point to those um because i guess what are some of the risk factors 
Uh, you know, we're talking about children, and I know you know parents watching the, the show here are going to want to know from you. So how maybe can I keep my kids from getting this dreaded ear infection? Maybe you can show again just the anatomy of the ear. So when we talk about that external canal versus a eustachian tube, an inner ear there. So most commonly with kids, we see otitis media, which is an infection of the middle ear. They're at a higher risk because of eustachian tube dysfunction, main reason. Um, their eustachian tube has not developed yet, um, so it is a lot thinner, more narrow. Um, it is also more in the horizontal position instead of slightly vertical. So the eustachian tube is, so you have your canal, um, the ear canal, and then your actual eardrum or tympanic membrane. The eustachian tube is the tube that drains the middle ear into the back of the nose right here. Uh, so whenever that is in a more horizontal position or thinner, it will cause recurrent uh, fluid behind the eardrum in young kids, increasing the chances of recurrent infections. Um, there are other things that put younger kids at risk for recurrent um, inner ear infections or otitis media, and that's also just a secondhand smoke exposure. So if they live with someone that smokes, um, even if you're not smoking in the house, but you're smoking outside, you're getting that secondhand smoke in the clothing. So that does increase more ear infections. Um, allergies, uh, kids' immunities haven't developed and aren't as strong as ours are, as adults are. Um, so they are more allergic, more sensitive to things that we aren't, um, or that we get uh, you know, uh, built up throughout our life. So the allergies will cause more mucus in the nose, um, more fluid behind the eardrum, and then more increased middle ear infections. Um, so treating the allergies will help a whole lot with that. Uh, things a lot of people don't think about is getting vaccinations and routine immunizations. Um, the pneumococcal vaccine, which is what is routine vaccinations for all kids, um, getting that and staying up to date on that does also decrease your risk or the kid's risk of a middle ear infection. Yeah, you know, we, we've done, um, well, one, you know, uh, we did a Doc Talk episode where you looked in my nose and, and you could see where that eustachian tube comes out. But, you know, speaking of vaccination, you know, we, we did a show where we talked about uh, the importance of vaccination. And I think, you know, folks, uh, when we talk about the uh, most common bacteria uh, associated with ear infections, um, it, it actually is something that we can prevent with pneumococcal vaccination. And, and for adults, you know, we recommend uh, you know, Prevnar 13 and then and the Pneumovax. So there's actually two different vaccines. And, and also, you know, I think, you know, it probably should also reduce risk of sinus infections as well. So, you know, I think it's important. But, you know, talking to some some of the, my colleagues that went to pediatrics, I think one of the things that they will say is that if the parents smoke, um, it is just dreadful trying to treat these kids with ear infections because they just keep getting recurrence after recurrence after recurrence and I know you know um, smoking in general uh, just inhibits the body's immune system uh, it increases the risk for, for bronchitis sinusitis and of course uh, otitis so again you know if your child's having recurrent um, ear infections and if there's someone in the house that smokes by all means um, you know discontinuing or, or smoking cessation would, would really help or really help that child so you know one of the things I think you know when we talk about uh, ear infections, uh, especially otitis media, which you show that's, you know, that, that inner ear or, or middle ear infection is, um, you know, antibiotics. And I know that, you know, that's kind of the mainstay. I know that, um, you know, there is concern obviously about resistance and recurrent ear infections and uses of antibiotics over and over again. So, so maybe, you know, you can talk to Dr. Peterson about, you know, someone that comes to you who has an ear infection. And I would imagine as an ear, nose, and throat specialist, I would suspect they've probably already seen either a primary care provider, such as a nurse practitioner or family practitioner or a pediatrician. So I would imagine by the time they get to you, they've probably already been on antibiotics. But is that something that you still use antibiotics? And, and at what point... Um, do you consider alternative treatments, uh, you know, for that ear infection? Sure, yeah. Uh, I mean, you're, you're correct. Uh, by the time patients have made it to us, they usually have been treated numerous times, but that's not always the case. Uh, I mean, standard, you know, first-line treatment for ear infections, 
um, kind of duels between antibiotic therapy when appropriate. Amoxicillin is the first line therapy, but that, that we use different antibiotics when appropriate. There is also this concept of observation and watchful waiting. And in the era of antibiotic stewardship, it, it, it's appropriate. Most of these will run their course without antibiotics. And so we, we try not to jump right to antibiotic every single time, but unfortunately it, it, they're often needed. When, when children come to us, it's usually because this has become a recurrent problem and they've had numerous infections um, or maybe they're in a bad spell where they've had three to four months of consistent infection that is really bothering them. Parents are frustrated, they're missing school, etc. So then we're, we're starting to look at treatments beyond just the antibiotics and other medical therapies and we start thinking about surgical options which revolves primarily around ear tubes or tympanostomy tubes. Um, tympanostomy tubes are the most common surgery that, that I perform along with most ENTs. It is a very simple, quick, easy procedure. Um, with children, we typically do it in the operating room and you're essentially making a small incision in the eardrum sucking out any fluid that might be there and then placing a small plastic tube through that incision that then the eardrum heals around and holds it in position. When I'm doing it, the procedure takes five to 10 minutes. It's very quick. With adults, I sometimes do it with them awake here in the office and that's simple as well. Um, the indications for ear tubes or tympanostomy tubes are that you've had three infections in six months or four infections in a year. For a lot of kids, that's easy to meet. The other indication is that you've had one infection with persistent fluid that's lasted for a long time, upwards of two to three months of persistent fluid. So, you know, I guess I'm, I'm so old. I remember back when I was a kid when you'd have a horrible earache and, you know, your, your parent would either one put a hot water bottle on your ear or a heating pad on your ear. And basically what was going on there? I mean, it would rupture the eardrum, right? Because I remember like this purulent drainage on my pillow, and, but I felt better. Sure. So in some sense, it's almost like, I guess, a poor man's way of like rupturing your eardrum to get the pressure off of the ear. Give, give a bad infection plenty of time and a little extra pressure, it will rupture on its own. The, the hope is that that's not always the case. And uh, yeah, by putting a, a tympanostomy tube in, it allows ventilation back and forth between that middle ear and external ear, like we talked earlier, which allows easier airflow, harder to get ear pain and pressure, harder to get an ear infection. So how long do, how long do these tubes last? So when, when you place a ventilation tube, how long does a tube last? Um, does it fall on its own? And are there different types of tubes that last different there, there are hundreds of different types of tubes made out of different materials. They should fall out on their own. Most tubes I advertise last between six and 12 months. Um, and the eardrum kind of heals and pushes the tube out simultaneously. It's a process that occurs. Um, so if someone's had ear tubes, does that mean that they can't have ear tubes again? Do you see kids or adults that is that have to come back and get tubes a second go around? Is that something you see? So, majority of times in young kids with recurrent inner ear infections, um, we put a set of tubes in. The tube is temporary. It does gradually come out in a period of six months to two years. Um, we see the kids every six months until the, the tube does fall out. The majority of time that gives the kid enough time for the eustachian tube to develop and to keep from being in that more horizontal position. Um, once the tube does fall out, if they start getting the recurrent ear infections again and they meet criteria, um, which is three infections in six months, four infections in one year, or retain fluid behind the eardrum for two to three months, then yes, they do qualify for another set of tubes. Uh, typically, if we are putting in a, another, a second set of tympanostomy tubes, uh, we will also recommend getting rid of the adenoids. So the adenoids is a tonsil-like structure in the back of the nose, close to where the eustachian tube opening is. Um, and if you get a lot of swelling in that, it will decrease the drainage of that eustachian tube. So removing the adenoids will also decrease the, the fluid accumulation behind the eardrum. So right before the break, I want to ask you one quick thing. So ear tubes, you got tubes, any certain precautions? Can the kid get in the shower? Can the child go swimming? Um, what kind of care does one need when you have a tube? We, we've loosened up on a lot of the restrictions. You know, years ago it was, you know, dry ears, dry ears. You had to use your earplugs all the time when you're swimming. 
Um, in our clinic, we have you keep your ears dry for three days after surgery, other than some ear drops that we use. And after that, we, we, we are pretty loose with the dry ear precautions. It is okay to get clean water in your ear. That's shower, bath, chlorinated pool water, especially when that, uh, that quantity is within reason. If you're swimming in water that has natural high bacteria counts, such as lakes, rivers, or oceans, it is probably smart to still use an earplug as the risk of getting an infection from that water does go up. And if they're going to get in that water, is there anything we do preventative? I hear talk, people talking about putting vinegar in their ear, hydrogen peroxide in their ear. Does that work at all? I would do none of those types of drops with a tube in place as it likely would burn. I usually have the parents armed with their own topical antibiotic ear drops that they just have at home. If they think they're getting an infection, they can start treating it uh, uh, quickly. And that's another benefit of the tympanostomy tubes as well. Um, there's no question as to whether or not you will have a middle ear infection. You actually have drainage coming from that ear. The benefit is you treat topically with ear drops, so antibiotic ear drops instead of oral antibiotics. So it saves the kid's gut and it saves the kid's bottom. So a lot of right, GI which is right, which is my world. So we talk when yeah. she's talking about the gut, meaning we don't disrupt, you know, the, that child's you know normal, normal healthy flora. bacteria that's so healthy, and again prevent yeast infections and all that. So um, we're getting ready to take a break. Uh, you folks are going to want to definitely stay tuned because these folks are going to talk about how to keep your ears clean. Uh, they're going to do an ear examination on me, see if I have any earwax. And if I do, they're going to talk about how to prevent earwax. Uh, so again, uh, you're watching Doc Talk. I'm Dr. Paul Connolly. So stay tuned and we'll be right back. Doc Talk with Dr. Paul Connolly is copyright 2021. Signer Foundation and is solely responsible for the content. And now, Doc Talk, brought to you by Plateau Medical Center. Here's Dr. Paul Connolly. Welcome back to Doc Talk. I'm Dr. Paul Connolly, and tonight we're talking about ears. And again, we have Dr. Andrew Peterson and Jamie Settle, which we've been talking about ear infections for the first half of the show, but now we're going to talk a little bit about earwax. And so we all know that as we get older, uh, we tend to make a little more earwax. And I know, you know, uh, patients, you know, will complain about lack of hearing or hearing loss. And, and they'll sometimes come to me wanting to know about getting a hearing aid. And sometimes they don't need a hearing aid. They just need to have their ears cleaned. And so um, I think, you know, what I'd like to have you guys do, if you don't care, is uh, do an exam. Talk about how you examine someone's ears and talk about what earwax is and does earwax even have a purpose and, uh, you know, how do we keep one's ears clean. So, uh, so maybe you talk a little bit about, you know, the ear itself and earwax and cleaning of the ears. Sure. It's a good topic because um, earwax is very common. Earwax is a good thing. Um, it, it, it has lots of benefits. And people have this feeling that they need to clean their earwax out all the time. And there's this, this fascination with over cleaning of their ears and people will clean their ears daily with different items. Q-tips being a very common example. And everyone is, is familiar with that. When you over clean your ears, you set yourself up for various ear infections. Like we talked about before, specifically otitis externa. Your wax is antibacterial, it's antimicrobial, it helps prevent yourself from getting that swimmer's ear infection over and over. So we really discourage people from cleaning their ears with whatever instrument, Q-tips being the most common with really high frequency. If you feel that you need your ears cleaned, it's best to see a professional and there's multiple methods of how you can clean wax. And we'll kind of go over a few of those here shortly. Um, maybe Jamie can kind of talk about some of the, 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 the benefits of earwax and kind of what its purpose is. So we all have earwax. Um, the skin of our ear canal is very thin skin, so it needs to be moisturized and it doesn't take much to dry it out. That's one of the biggest uh, purposes of earwax is moisturization to the skin of the ear canal. Um, it is also slightly acidic, so in that being acidic, it is an antibacterial antimicrobial so it does prevent infections um, and that's one of the reasons we see a lot of people with ear pain so you can have some ear pain and discomfort um, and they think it's a middle ear infection like we talked about previously but they use too much q-tips or bobby pins other things to get rid of the wax there's no wax there and it causes irritation to the ear canal causing pretty significant ear pain and discomfort 
So let's take a look at my ears. Let's do it. Um, you know, you, you asked like, how do we examine someone's ears? And it's great because we've got multiple options here. So, you know, this, the standard tool, and I'll just kind of show this uh, on the camera here. So the, the standard tool is an otoscope. This is something that you would find at most medical clinics, your primary care, the ER, etc. You know, this is just a nice standard uh, tool to be able to look inside the ear. Luckily, we've got a few extra tools here that we can use. Um, we have a microscope. This is a high powered LED light microscope. Let's pull this into frame here. There you go. You can see it. Um, it's fantastic. It's got multiple sets of magnification. Wonderful for examining the ear. You can be two handed while you're examining um, and we'll use it for cleaning ears, cleaning wax, maybe removing a foreign body which we see all different variations of that, examining a perforation, um, various items there. And then lastly, we've also got a rigid cameras, which we're gonna use here in a moment, um, which is another high def magnified lens that we can use to uh, examine the ear. And we're gonna use that to examine your ear now. Right, so again, folks, uh, Dr. Pearson is trained, so we're not using, as Jamie says, no, no Q-tips, bobby pins, keys, uh, yeah, my, my father was always notorious to stick a key in his ear and clean it out. So, again, so basically still rule of thumb is nothing other than your elbow. Is that right? Is that still what we say as far as? That's correct. That's so correct. Basically meaning nothing goes into the ear. I, I say that the ear should be a little bit oily and dirty. Okay. <laughs> Why don't you get that light on, right? Well, we'll see if I can accommodate with oily and dirty ears. So, let's okay. see what we got. All right, so first, let's just look in your ear and... You want to hold it? Go right ahead. First, we're just going to look in your ear and uh, kind of see what our exam shows. Wonderful. Perfect. You do not clean your ears too much because you actually have some earwax. All the time we look in and there's no earwax and that's part of the problem. But in your instance, you do have a little bit of earwax. Um, some would say that's gross. I would say that is not the case. That is a normal looking ear and I'm happy to see that. But we will clean that out today for uh, kind of demonstration purposes. Here we can go beyond that even and uh, look at your eardrum. That's a wonderful, normal looking eardrum. You can see the, the, the tympanic membrane itself. You can see the middle ear ossicles. That's the malleus that is right there. Um, that's the first ossicle and that's a normal looking eardrum. Why don't we uh, see if we can help your hearing and uh, clean that ear wax out. So typically we clean the ears um, with a microscope um, and a little suction. Uh, during the ear cleaning, you may hear a little bit of a high pitch hum from the suction itself. Um, whenever we do that, we get the suction directly on the ear wax to gently remove it off of the canal and pull it out. Occasionally, uh, we will use also very small uh, alligator forceps to grab a hold of the wax as well. And you can see that came out. That's a doozy, Dr. Conley. I aim to please for dog talk. <laughs> so let me ask about, um, I, I see like ear rinses and people will do like these almost like water pick. Is that something that you would recommend people do at home or, or not so much? So we recommend if you're going to, if you have a history of a lot of earwax buildup, uh, what you should use at home to clean your own ears is an over-the-counter eardrop called Debrox. Um, and we recommend if you have a buildup of that to do the Debrox about 10 drops in the ear. Um, so lay on the side, put 10 drops on whatever ear you're wanting to do. Gently massage right in front of the ear. Let it set for about 10 minutes, set up, and then whatever drains out, wipe it off with a, with a clean cloth. And um, that is safe to do, um, you know, if you need to decrease it. But come in and see us if you have problems or feel the need to do Q-tips. And then I'll just make the comment, you know, there, there's multiple ways to clean ears. We're, we're, we're blessed with some, uh, some fancy equipment here that kind of expands what we can offer, uh, but a common method of cleaning the ears is a, is a water flush. And so you might have experienced that or know someone that has. That's a great technique, and some of the time it works great. And other times the wax is just too dense, too hard, too much, and it can't get it all out. And so that's where all of these different instruments that we have, suction, small forceps, etc., can kind of uh, help some of the trickier situations. And some people prefer to avoid all of that water irrigation in the ear, uh, which for some folks, it can even be a little bit tender, painful, and, uh, and can uh, even make you dizzy. 
So as far as like, um, you know, as far as someone feels like that, that they're plugged up or stopped up, um, uh, when should someone come again to see you folks? And do you have certain individuals that just routinely come in um, like monthly or quarterly or biannually just for – a good ear cleaning, you know, just coming in for routine maintenance. Um, and, and as you get older, cause I'm always heard, you know, um, especially as a man, you know, we get hair in our ears. And, and so do you, is that something that you see more commonly as you get older problems with, you know, um, cerumen impaction, I guess, which is packed, you know, earwax. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is true that earwax tends to get more dense as we get older. Earwax is different for everyone in terms of its composition and quantity. Um, but yes, we have lots of patients that we see on regular intervals. I, I would say that you would first identify it by feeling something in your ear, maybe f some muffled hearing, and someone has looked in your ear, maybe your primary doctor, um, and, and kind of identified this wax. Um, if they're able to clean it out, wonderful. And if not, we're happy to see you we see people on interval that's appropriate for their wax production. For a lot of people, that's every six months. There are some people that it's more frequent, every three months. Um, and we have lots of patients that came to us with the concern of recurrent ear infection. Turns out they never really were having infections or they were seldom. It's actually a wax impaction or some other ear problem. And now we're seeing them on a regular basis to keep their ears clean, keep their ears healthy, and keep their wax out. Thank you. So I guess that's a wrap. I'm Dr. Paul Connolly, and you've been watching Doc Talk. Until next time, have a good night.